Yeah. Um, I uh, apologize for not realizing it was Wednesday. Hopefully some of you realize that there's a farmer's market in Cesar Chavez where you could have gotten really good fresh fruit and a really good pizza if the pizza guy's there. So um, you still have till 2 if anyone wants to make a mad dash. I'll, uh, I'll recall your cards if you're not here when I call you. All right. Next up, Paul Fujitani, Bureau of Reclamation. Okay, we lost a, lost a couple. <laughs> That's good. Um, thank you, Chair Marcus. Thank um, you. I just have a real brief comment to make, and, and somewhat probably reinforces some things John Leahy had indicated. indicated. There have been times this past year when our interior delta water quality did not react as expected using our estimated delta inflow, our assumed delta consumptive use, exports, and uh, the net delta outflow index. And then January and February were good examples of this. Um, and this is where it, I think additional information on the delta consumptive use and, and probably some strengthful information like was noted this morning would be helpful for us to determine what's happening out there in the Delta. Additional information on the actual consumptive use in the Delta would also provide a number of benefits for water operations, potential benefits for water operations. The data, data would be, may be useful for operational planning and scheduling purposes, but it would also be helpful in improving our, our um, defining or complex modeling we're doing of the Delta environment. And also along with that too is, uh, it, I think it would help out with our modeling of the delta water quality, just getting additional information on what's happening there as opposed to a lot of the standard index indices we're using right now. That could also affect some other delta features that we evaluate and model, including um, operations of the delta cross channel gates, the old and middle river flow, maybe QoS flows, and also delta water levels. And that concludes my comments. I, I just have a quick question and Mr. Leahy can come back and answer too, but uh, uh, thinking about that chart, I mean, I think maybe I was hungry, so I didn't have, and I also was so uh, geared on ending right at 1230 because of yesterday that I, I didn't <laughs> think of a question, but did the chart that you showed say to you that something weird was happening in January and that's why? it would be helpful because it seemed to track through the classic irrigation season, but January was the month that looked weird if I understood the chart. That's right, yes. When, uh, January in particular was, was where it did not capture which would have been an extraordinary uh, diversion pattern uh, that was occurring. And that's, that's really the, that's, that's the big concern about not having real time. And I don't I don't know that we would be able to capture that kind of uh, well, the dramatic request, change. Well, the request that gets to it is not to do that, but yeah. real time. Yeah, I mean, with not. even with this, uh, you know, the sat proposed satellite information, I don't know that, that gets to that uh, that sort of question as far as uh, you know whatever diversions were were occurring at that particular time. That's not likely to show up in um, uh, the kind of satellite information that uh, is been, was proposed. Um, so that, that's more of a need for just real-time, um, extraordinary changes to diversion patterns. So, but that, that potentially that's a, a different question. Again, we're asking for people what should we try to figure out. Right, Not, right. That wouldn't be what our draft order would get at or the proposed draft order would get at necessarily. Yeah, I don't have any specific... Uh, recommendations on that, mm -hmm. how that's written. It's, it's asking for additional information. Um, and generally, I tried to portray what, what kinds of information when and when we would need it in these kind of extraordinary conditions. And, and certainly, if we're looking at kind of an outlier type uh, scenario, um, which that 99% you know, would certainly be, and, and we talked about how speculative that would be, well, this is, this is one of the those parts of right. speculation, you know, we, we have no way of, of getting at that, that type of information, so. 
So presumably that's true for diversions of all kinds, though not just in the delta. Uh, that would be correct, yes. Yeah. Right. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Great. Thank you for coming, and we may have more questions. Get through everybody's comments first. Mr. Jackson. Now, this is a topic on which many of the commenters talked about evidentiary hearings. So yes. Take it away. Um, and uh, we filed a, uh, what you are characterizing as a complaint um, in regard to the diversions of the, right. the Bureau and DWR. Um, CSPA is, is both a, um, an environmental group and a um, in-delta landowner. Um, at the town of Collinsville. Um, and um, so we will, uh, I will not address the issues in our complaint at this point because you've indicated some desire to deal with that differently. Um, what I would like to do um, is back to the sort of environmental hat. Mm -hmm. um, the, um, the loss in January um, seems to me to be uh, indicative of what's going to happen um, if there's no rain in the future. Uh, and here's, here's some things that I would like to propose to you for your, um, your thought, your staff's thought. Uh, and it is this. Um, in uh, January, um, there is a large amount of flow coming out coming into both of the uh, both the Oroville facility and the um, Shasta facility from streams that are running relatively full uh, even in the drought and that's because their uh, headwaters are springs uh, the pit system is a is almost completely spring fed and uh, it doesn't change much um, some, but not much, in droughts in the, in the Shasta. Uh, that number may be as high as a million acre feet. Um, in, uh, in my home county, um, the Lake Almanor sits on top of what was called Big Springs, um, and which is generates, uh, has never generated less than 750 CFS, um, no matter whether it's raining or not. Um, the so um, when you release water from either facility uh, in a normal situation uh, both the Feather River below Oroville and the uh, and the Sacramento River below Shasta uh, for a appreciable portion of their um, uh, of the distance toward the Delta are gaining streams they're attached to the groundwater system, and because it's usually raining, um, the groundwater system is pumping water into the surface water system if it's full. And in those areas, generally it's full. And there's an awful lot of agriculture, rice and others, that tend to recharge, as you've heard uh, from the, fo the gentleman who came from the Porterville area to talk about how um, the addition of, of agricultural water kept their um, uh, municipal system intact. And so that happens um, for a large portion of the Sacramento River. When it didn't rain for three years, uh, and when we've been doing groundwater substitutions along the river, the, um, uh, it is distinctly possible uh, that those near river groundwater systems are now being recharged by the released water before you get to the delta. So my suggestion would be that this is a good time to learn about the system um, and that we ought to look upstream to find out why in, in uh, January um, of 2014 uh, the, the whole system was operating differently. And I think it's likely, I certainly haven't hired anybody to, to discern this information yet, but um, I think it's very likely that it's the drought itself, and it's uh, the fact that 
th the groundwater tables are not as full as they normally are and that it's recharging above the delta. And so if you really think this is a difficult, I mean, something that we need to get to in the middle of this drought, um, we should be collecting the data from everybody in the watershed and not just picking out one group. A number of people have said that. Right. Um, the, the second thing is, um, I, I think long run, uh, because I think the 20th, first century hydrology is likely to be different than the 20th century hydrology, that um, the, the, the board and staff take a, a good close look at the, um, what actually the natural flow is into the reservoirs so that we know whose water it is that's coming out of the reservoirs. And I don't think we've ever needed to do that, but I, I definitely think that we do this year um, because of the conditions of, of Shasta and Oroville and Trinity, um, all of which are completely outside of the normal scope of things. And so um, I think you can learn more um, by uh, broadening the inquiry. Um, uh, you can learn a lot about transfers, substituted groundwater transfers. You can learn about natural recharge. You can learn about um, what natural flow is. Um, and, and these are all things that even if the legal decisions get made in another venue or in a different venue of yours, um, the, uh, all of this factual stuff is going to be extremely important um, as you grapple with these problems. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Dean Ruiz for South Delta Water Agency, WIC. Hello. Hello. Good afternoon, uh, Dean Reese for South Delta and for WIC. Um, just a couple of, I submitted a comment letter on behalf of WIC and also on okay. South Delta. John Herrick also submitted a comment letter on behalf of South Delta. John can't be here and he apologizes for that. I won't reiterate everything that's in that letter, but just a, a couple of points I, I wanted to make. Um, help, help us think this through. Yes. Uh, well the, the first thing is, you know, we've indicated uh, that we think if you're going to move forward this type of process, you need to do it in a formal hearing setting to um, arrive at some of these factual issues, to decide some of these factual issues, which we think are largely self-evident, but particularly with respect that there's always water available in the delta. Um, and if for some reason that still is unclear, if you're going to go forward with this process, then we should at least be able to determine that um, and to determine what the other sources of water are that contribute to the delta. And within that also, of course, is the question of um, can, is there water available to divert in the delta in the absence of the projects? And we think the answer to that is yes as well. So at a minimum, if you're going to go forward with something like this, which I think we question the timing of why we would do that, go th forward with a process like this at this time, but at least would get to those threshold issues, which uh, then, of course, raise a number of other issues, such as the burden shifting and the commingling issue, which are, you're going to have to confront once I think you uh, conclude the obvious determination that there's water available in the delta at all times. But then I would just like to ask you, if you're not going to, and I, I don't know what you're going to do, but if you end up deciding well, you're not going to have a hearing, you're not going to have a formal hearing, then what would be the point of this information? I mean, we hear people come up from the projects and they say information is good, it sure would be nice to have this information. Uh, information is always good. But if you're not going to go forward with a, a formal hearing and you're going to ask us to go through in five days or however many days, I got a feeling you'll end up saying five days is too short, maybe you've got 30 days or whatever, whatever it is, it's still not going to be long enough. But if you're not going to go forward with a hearing, then what's going to be the point of us gathering this information, what you generally already gather through the statements of diversion and use? I don't know what the process or the point would that be. I imagine the information is going to then end up being available to whoever else through a public records request, and then it just ends up being um, served as sort of a a discovery process for those folks for the projects who continue to assert that we don't have the right to divert water at this time or at any time in some uh, circumstances. So again, my, my question is what is the point of this at this point in time, particularly if you're not going to go forward with a formal hearing? Thank you. Okay. 
Thank you. We're, we haven't decided what we're going to do. It's just question asked, and then in the context, I'm, I'm just trying to answer a little bit, in the context of a drought, there are, as we went through the curtailment process, it would be very difficult to do curtailment based on the information we have in the Delta or other places, and these other questions arise, and different people have different views of them, and the comments are interesting, not just in terms of what we might do in this drought, but in trying to move forward on this decades, decades, long is so is not your jerk, no I'm not level of discourse that we've had on these issues and it'd just be nice to move past that. So we're not just dealing with because of the drought, we're dealing because we were asked and trying to figure out and asking all of you what's the utility, what could we do that would be useful. Jennifer Spoletta for various Delta landowners. Good afternoon, Jennifer Spoletta, and I'm representing all of my landowner clients today. Um, I do represent lots of landowners in the Delta, and I've spent a lot of time on water use reporting over the last five years and water rights research. And I just want to say, first of all, thank you for having the guts to take the step back and say, this is an emergency and I need to do something, but if I'm going to do something, I want it to be meaningful and I want to do it right because process is extremely important when you're dealing with complicated issues and competing arguments. And so I appreciate that you have taken that step back and you're thinking about how to approach what is a very important issue and a problem in how we proceed. Because my clients call me, and they have literally called me week in and week out since December, asking if they're going to be able to divert water. I think they recognize that when these issues get resolved, which they should, they may not like all of the answers. They may not like all of the resolutions, but they want the resolution. They want the certainty. And so I want to emphasize to you how important it is to my clients that if you're going to approach this issue, you do it through an evidentiary hearing, you put the legal issues out, you let Everyone fight it out over what the law should be. We let the courts decide it finally, and we have some certainty. And I, I just strongly encourage you, if you're going to entertain complaints about water diversion in the Delta because of lack of water availability, that you go ahead and dig in. You address the hard factual issues. You do the evidentiary hearing. You address the hard legal issues, and let's get to the bottom of it. Because these guys that are my clients, guys and gals, they want to pass their farms on to their kids. And they want to be able to know how it's going to work. So they, they need the answers. Um, I would also, if you give me a few more minutes, like yeah. to um, ask you to think about a couple of key questions when it comes to requesting information. The chart that DWR and the Bureau referred to showing the spike in January was really illuminating to me. Because I think if we had heard, being in the Delta, if we had heard a telephone call saying, we've got something funny going on here. We need to find out if there are any big diversions or if there are any big releases of discharges going on right now. We need to modify our model. I think they would have gotten a really good cooperative response. And I think that response could still come today. Delta diversions are not the only assumption or variable that goes into their model. There are others, as you heard Mr. Jackson describe. We need to get to the bottom of that model. We should have good models. We should have good information on Delta diversions. The proposed order you have in front of you today will not get you that information. But cooperative processes between the project operators and the people in the Delta who know what's going on will get that information. And that should be strongly encouraged, but it won't happen with your order. Mm -hmm. What will happen with your order, if you were to adopt it in its current form, is my phone and the phones of all of these other Delta attorneys will start ringing off the hook. And the handful of people we have that can do chain of title research um, will be overburdened. And we will provide you with a lot of information about Delta water rights, which your staff, frankly, does not have the time or money to process nor could they do it in any kind of reasonable time period to actually come up with um, enforcement proceedings for
for the literally hundreds of different diversions there are in the Delta. I question why you would do that from a water rights prove up standpoint to just the Delta. I mean, isn't proving up valid water rights important for every diverter in California? And I also question why would you do it now? I thought proving a valid water right was important in every year, not just a drought year. And then if you're going to do it in the Delta, why are you going to do it to every diverter in the Delta? A lot of them have actually taken a, quite a bit of care in filling out their statements of diversion and use. Not all of them have marked a pre-1914 right. Many who have marked it have put a specific year. So these kind of broad brush treatments I think really need to be reconsidered because it just creates a lot of work and resource spending by both the regulated community and by your staff that don't get to the heart of the issue that we need to resolve. So I appreciate your time. I appreciate the step back and thinking about the process. Thank you. Thank you for your comments as well. Oh, wait, can I ask a question? And I, I could have, this was in uh, Mr. Nomalini's too. Just so that I'm clear, a number of people have said, hold an evidentiary hearing on some of the factual issues. But some have said, go straight to the courts on the legal issues versus us taking a crack at it. And I, do you have thoughts on that? I do. I was one of the ones who said some of those legal issues should go straight to the court. OK. I'll Help tell me you understand why. how we would do that. Sure. There are, well, you could certify questions uh, to the court. Yeah. Uh, as a group, you could stipulate to file a duck relief action asking for declaratory relief as to certain issues. Um, and a good example of these kinds of issues is the following. Can a riparian diverter in the delta divert water that is essentially a mix of fresh water coming from the San Joaquin and Sacramento River and um, essentially ocean water that comes in through the bay? Is that a valid exercise of a riparian right? Hmm. The reason that we think that would be a logical question to certify up to the court is because the law on this point is like 100 years old, and it was developed by the courts. So they're really in the best position to, to review that history, the precedent, and reach a decision. Um, and then you can obviously apply it to the facts that you determine through your evidentiary hearing. And there are going to be lots of facts about what types of water enters the delta. We also think it would be more expedient yeah, uh, nice, yeah. because otherwise you have to wait to get through your ev evidentiary hearing, then you issue a decision, and then there's an appeal of that decision. You have the evidentiary record to, to deal with. You could be dealing with evidentiary issues, and separately the legal issues could be decided by the court. Uh, so those are the reasons, and we just think that division of resources, I mean, frankly, I, you guys have a very full plate. I actually read the executive director's report start to finish for the first time in a long time, and I was, it took a very long time to read it, and I just think you have a lot on your plate. So you don't need to be serving as, you know, frankly, a, a discovery associate for people who are complaining about water rights. These people should have the initiative to go in and dig into it themselves, go to court, fight about it, get a decision. You shouldn't have to do all that. Thank you. Eric Ringelberg, Local Agencies of the North Delta. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Eric Ringelberg, Local Agencies for the North Delta. Uh, land is a coalition of 18 reclamation and water districts in the North Delta, uh, but they're individual water districts forming an association. They um, don't uh, uh, represent the um, North Delta Water Agency, just to be clear. And I believe they may be making comments later. Uh, so it's been fascinating to, to hear this discussion from an attorney's point of view, but from an ecological and hydrological perspective, a slightly different perspective. And so. I'll make, uh, add to our written comments two points. One is obviously five days, in our opinion, is, is too short a period of time. But I think it begs the question of whether or not any amount of time is sufficient to answer the question of the diversions. I think the Delta Water Master has done a fantastic job uh, of pulling together that information. We have years of those data. Uh, we also have alternate means of verifying those data. The, you've heard a little bit about the satellite data. We've been a participant in that. Um, but there's lots of ways of, of cross-validating. And the Delta water use model, we know roughly what the maximum consumptive use could be in the Delta. 
If there's an offset in the timing, that's a great question, and that's a question we would love to work to figure out what's happening in January. Because we don't have, first of all, our parents uh, don't have uh, storage, but we also have elevated groundwater. In that time of year, even in a drought, we had lots of water. We're draining water off of those districts. Mm -hmm. So there's yeah. a mismatch there that may not be a real mismatch. It may be a modeling mismatch. Are, and we'd are love folks farming in January? Typically they could, not. right? Or they no? could in theory. Some of the small holdings could. Um, not enough daylight hours. So, um, our, our problem is really getting rid of the water, not bringing water onto the districts in that time of year. So we'd love to work uh, with DWR and the contractors to figure out what that mismatch might be. Um, and that gets to that consumptive use side of the equation, which is this conversation is largely, with the exception of, of Mr. Jackson's comments, been focused on consumptive use. That's great. We feel we have a really good handle on with the work that's been done. Uh, you can access, you can figure out how much, how much water's been used, where the diversions are located. We now know, we have good GPS locations for the vast majority of those. We have a good side of that model. The part that I feel that we're weakest on is actually on the source. And, and Mr. Jackson spoke to that a little bit. Um, we've looked at uh, the avail publicly available hydro information on that, and we have a very difficult time reconciling what the base flow is, where is that base flow occurring. Uh, there's uh, so in addition to the base flow, there's also hyperreic flow, which is not measured under using traditional instrumentation. That's an area of concern of ours because that's natural flow. And in drought, that's all the natural flow in many conditions. And so that's something we really want to get a handle on. The legal questions, I'll leave that to the attorneys, but from a technical perspective, I feel that we lack the substantive information to make the assertions that the water that they're claiming is theirs is really theirs. And that goes to what's being stored over multiple years, uh, what's being stored when there should be natural flow released, as, as the board has identified earlier. And so from a technical perspective, what I'd recommend then, prior to any sort of um, legal process, is that we have a technical process here. We bring, there's only a handful of modelers, uh, bring the folk, staff from DWR, bring the folks from the rec districts here, and let's talk about the model. Let's talk about where that w model is sensitive and insensitive to changes. Let's talk about what the water and where that water came from before we get to the point of whether or not it's being consumptively used in the delta. That to me, I think, seems a much more difficult question. Let's at least start with the foundation of knowing what, what, what are we talking about. So that's it. Thank open you. Open to any questions you may have. Thank you. Okay, thank you. It's helpful to go through everybody and then we'll have questions. Um, Curtis Keller from San Joaquin County. Uh, good afternoon, Curtis Keller, Special Water Council for San Joaquin County. Uh, I think a lot of the comments that have been uh, already said today uh, the county agrees with are good comments uh, with respect to the need for evidentiary hearings uh, to to discern the the real issue I think that's before the board in determining water availability in the Delta um, the county's comments are going to focus particularly on the draft order um, which would require all senior water right diverters uh, in the Delta to respond within five days um, I think that obviously pushes a, a, a um, a hefty burden and an unfair burden on a, a single region within the state uh, to to respond in that manner. Five days is, is certainly, we feel, an insufficient amount of time uh, to respond to the request for information. It takes time to, to compile that information. Uh, they may uh, wish to seek you know, the advice of legal counsel to understand their rights and obligations in responding to that to that order, um, particularly if the order were to be issued in the uh, immediate future. Um, many Delta uh, farmers are currently in the midst of harvest, and uh, you know, so the uh, ask of providing that information in the near term uh, with such a short window would certainly uh, uh, be unrealistic. Um, the second, the information being requested is for the most part already accessible to the board. Uh, the initial statements and supplemental statements that are, are submitted uh, contain that information. Um, with respect to real-time data and the request, uh, I mean, I think everybody agrees for the most part that uh, uh, real-time data is important in this situation. Um, but I think we have to step back and ask why we're getting that data. 
Um, it, it is for the, the question of determining water availability. Um, are we using the right mechanism uh, with the board's authority under the emergency regulations? Um, All right. I mean, that goes, I think, to, to maybe the, my third and last point, which is the emergency regulations authorize the board to request additional information based on a complaint um, alleging interference with a water right or upon receipt of information indicating uh, unlawful diversions. Um, in, in this case, uh, you know, the, the proposed draft order would require information and responses by all water right holders in the Delta, all senior water right holders in the Delta without uh, identifying any specific facts or specific allegations as to uh, an interference or an unlawful diversion. Uh, since 2009, the, the Delta Watermaster and State Board staff has gone through extensive uh, fact gathering and evaluation of, of Delta diversions and for the most part, uh, for the vast majority of Delta diversions are good actors and, and uh, lawful diverters of water. Um, so I, I think it's questionable whether or not the emergency regulations is the right mechanism uh, for requesting that information. Um, which I think, in conclusion, just brings us to, again, water availability uh, and, and uh, some threshold questions that have to be answered probably before the information that's being looked for in the draft order really becomes necessary um, and before we place that burden on, on Delta water right holders. Um, so I think just in conclusion, we support the, the notion that I think has been raised several times, um, you know, evidentiary hearings, whether it's through the court or through, through this body, to understand those, those, those threshold questions of what water um, uh, is available in the Delta um, uh, before we get to, to, to placing that burden on, on uh, uh, the diverters themselves to provide information. Thank you. Thank you. Next, I have a packet of cards that wanted to come up together. I have Curtis Creel from Kern County Water Agency, Jose Gutierrez from Westlands Water District, John Rubin from San Luis and Delta Mendota Water Authority, and Stephanie Morris from the State Water Contractors. Do you want me to have them do five minutes each, or do you want he did a set it at 20 and you'll duke it out. What did this mean, 20? All, all, it, all it together. Okay. Cool. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, I am Curtis Creel. I'm the Assistant General Manager for Kern County Water Agency. Uh, we did put together a panel today. I'll be describing uh, the concerns of the uh, state and federal contractors and provide some estimates of the impacts that we see to both projects. <clears throat> Jose Gutierrez, who is the Deputy General Manager for Resources for uh, Westlands Water District, will discuss the impacts specifically to Westlands Service Area. And John Rubin, General Counsel for San Luis and Delta Mendota Water Authority, will address the need for State Board to act and to obtain additional information and make recommendations on how to proceed. Finally, Stephanie Morris, our general counsel for the state water contractors, will provide some closing comments. Let me first start by talking about the impacts to the state water project, the Central Valley project, or at least to the, from our perspective, what those effects are on the contractors. And we're very narrowly focused on looking at the effects that local diversions, specifically in the South Delta, would have during periods when natural flows would not be at a level to sustain the level of, of current diversions. There is a uh, graphic that was put together by um, Terry Erlewine, who's the general manager for the state water contractors, and based on analysis, if you want to bring that up. Um, And I'll describe very briefly what is in this graphic. Um, it is a depiction or an example for year 2013. The blue line that you see that starts around uh, 3,000 CFS and then it, it, within June or early July and then drops down to below 500 CFS for the remainder of the summer months 
represents an estimate of the um, unimpaired flows that are contributed from all the tributaries to the San Joaquin River. A more conservative estimate of the water supply that would be available for diversion out of the South Delta is represented by the black line. That's actually the, the um, measured flows at Vernalis or that were recorded from the Vernalis gauge. And that's a combination of natural and and uh, upstream reservoir operations, that's correct. The other, the other caveat, of course, is the estimate of, of the um, unimpaired runoff, or the blue line, does not factor in any of the upstream impairments that would occur by those diverters that, that are along the, the, the San Joaquin River and it would have, you know, presumably rights to divert those flows. The red line represents an estimate of the consumptive use that would occur in the South Delta. This is not based on uh, diversion records because of course we do not have that. It is based on an esti estimates of um, the crop use within the South Delta applied over the um, uh, irrigated acreage or what we perceive to be the irrigated acreage within the South Delta. The hashed line that you see is an estimate of the impact to the state and federal projects when we represent um, water that would have been uh, previously stored uh, by those projects um, and so therefore would represent project water. The impact on the state and federal projects is either one, they have to make additional releases from upstream we're more likely in uh, a, a situation like this where um, the uh, hydrology is, is very low, they are reducing the amount of water that would be made available for export and available to um, the uh, um, state and federal contractors. This represents approximately 100,000 acre feet of impact. Uh, we believe it to be a conservative estimate of the effects in 2013. State water contractor staff are still doing the analysis for 2014, but have estimated the level of impacts to be well in excess of 100,000 acre feet. To put that into context, when you aggregate those two amounts for those two years, that is more water than what was allocated by the state water project to the um, public water agencies that are receiving water from them. For Kern County Water Agency, the impact to us is twofold. First of all, uh, there's only a few things that you can do when you're dealing with uh, uh, irrigated acreage. You can conserve or fallow, um, and you can look for additional water supplies. One of the, the sources of water or one of our water management programs, which we're very blessed with, is a very robust banking project. And uh, for example, in 2014, we had to draw upon that approximately 340 or 350,000 acre feet to, uh, previously banked water uh, that was within those banking projects and utilize that within the service area. Every drop that is illegally diverted and not provided to the state water project means that that's additional water that has to come out of those banking projects in a year like this and it's not available to address the needs of Kern County in next year, presumably a, a, another dry year. At this point, I'd like to turn it over to Jose Cuteras, um, and then I guess if there's questions at the end, we could address those uh, jointly. Okay. Hi, my name is Jose Gutierrez. I'm with Westlands Water District, I'm the Deputy General Manager for Water Resources. And I'm gonna summarize the experience uh, and, and the challenges that we faced in Westlands, by our farmers, and by the surrounding communities that, uh, that work in the agricultural related industries within Westlands. Now Westlands and its farmers, to start off with, we, we acquired approximately 146,000 acre feet north of Delta of water that we were hoping to transfer south of Delta this year. And we, the water we, usually typically comes in the months of July, August, and September, but this year Central Valley Operations was unable to transfer that water down to us. And it was primarily because of excessive depletions in the Delta. 
And that was explained to us by CVO. Now, if the water had been able to get transferred to us, we, in a year like this, we expected to lose about 30% of the water in carriage water loss as it moved through the delta. So for just net quantities, Westlands could have received about 100,000 acre feet this year. Now, depending on farming operations and how growers blended that surface water with groundwater, that represents about 40 to 60,000 acres of land that could have been irrigated this year that were not during those three summer months. Now, just for a matter of scale, 60,000 acre feet represents about two city of San Francisco's in size, to give you an idea of scale we're talking about here. So that was one of the biggest impacts. We didn't have the water that we were expecting this year to irrigate, and, and it really hurt our, our farmers. Now, the cost impacts associated with not having that water that we could not deliver, many of our water users, our growers, were forced to buy water on the spot market. There was some of water available south of Delta that was stored in San Luis Reservoir from last year. And those water users, those farmers, were forced to pay up to $2,000 per acre foot in some instances on the spot market. And again, for scale, $2,000 per acre foot represents about seven to 10 times more than they would typ typically spend for either project water or supplemental water that the district purchases on their behalf. So if you think about from a business perspective, you're entering the year and then your water costs increase by 10 times. It's, it's, hard to, it's hard to absorb that cost. So many of our farmers throughout this entire year and summer were living on the edge of failure. And they were always thinking, if I can just get this next 10 acre feet or 20 acre feet, I can make it through the end of the year and make it until next year and hopefully I'll recover. Those that did not have the finances or access to service water, if they were fortunate enough to have a groundwater well, they turned to groundwater and pumped as their only source of supply. And groundwater is fine in most cases, but within Westlands, there are some constituents in the groundwater that are not favorable for agriculture. So as a result, when they're irrigating with 100% groundwater, many of the constituents in the, in the groundwater decrease the yields on their crops for almonds is, is one example. And many, many of our farmers experienced a 20% reduction in yield this year. They also had to harvest early because they're running out of water. So not only did they not mature as, as nicely as they wanted,